by way of introduction of myself. So Chelsea Dosad is a director in KPMG's Infrastructure Advisory Group. Um, I'm an economist by background and I lead our economics capability within the context of infrastructure. And actually, as um, really Ron's already touched on, thinking in the broadest sense about the range of benefits that investments in the infrastructure space can, can deliver for different um, parties. Uh, so I'll let Will introduce himself in a bit, um, but to kick us off then, just a brief um, presentation on the report's um, findings, uh, and then we'll get into a good discussion. So, um, let's see. great, okay. So to kick us off then, so just I guess to kind of build on Ron's introduction and just recap on the rationale for the study in, in the first place. So I think we're all familiar with the well-documented um, productivity challenges that are facing the sector, which ultimately means that uh, building and maintaining the country's built assets costs more and takes longer than it should do. And yet we've got ambitious national policy objectives to build back better, level up the national economy and transition to net zero. And those objectives require two things. They require substantial levels of public and private investment in our built assets, but also secondly, that investment to be more cost effective. And what I mean by that is delivering at a lower cost um, and better outcomes in terms of the quality and sustainability of our infrastructure. And yet we've seen over the last 10 years, a step change in the sector's um, adoption of, of information management practices. I think in recognition that access to information of the right quality and at the right time plays a key role in the sector's digital transformation and also ultimately the, the performance of our built assets. But um, till this point, there's been limited evidence that looks at the kind of holistic value um, that's created both within and beyond the sector in terms of using information management. So it was against that background that CBB posed those two key questions to us, which Ron's already outlined. So, um, how are organisations employing information management practices, considering importantly the use cases for IM at both the organisational level and project level, and then thinking through what value does that create for those organisations, but looking more broadly beyond the organisation to customers, society and the economy. So to respond to that, those exam questions, um, we, we, uh, we took an approach which really comprised four key building blocks. So firstly, as you'd expect, um, a comprehensive review of the existing literature on the value of information management in the construction and infrastructure sector uh, and flagging through that review key gaps in the evidence base. And then supplementing or addressing some of those gaps through firstly some bottom up analysis of uh, 11 real world case studies and I'm pleased that We've got many of the stakeholders involved in those case studies that are attending today. And that provides new evidence on the value created by IAM uh, at the organisational level and beyond. And then secondly, looking at um, if, if we were to assume widespread adoption of IAM across the sector, um, what wider returns would that generate for the UK economy? So taking a top-down economic impact modelling approach, and I'll touch on each of those a bit later. And then finally, throughout the course of work, engaging with um, key experts from across CDB and the hub in terms of um, formulating and iterating our approach. And so uh, the outcome of that um, approach really are sort of three key outputs I would highlight and we'll touch on those today. Um, firstly, it was necessary to develop a bespoke definition of IEM um, within the context of the sector, which captures the use of IEM principles at the project level across the life cycle of assets, but also that organisational level lens across functions. Um, and we'll all touch on that uh, in a bit. Secondly, uh, what we've termed the information management benefits framework, so based on that literature review and based on that new um, analytical evidence, we formed an overall framework to guide future decisions around investing in IM. And then finally, uh, the outcome of all of our analysis has been establishing new qualitative and quantitative evidence 
on the value that IM can create. Um, and that's aligned to the framework that we set out in the report. And uh, that evidence is set out in sort of two key products or reports, uh, which were published on the 16th. Uh, hopefully everyone's had a chance to, to read. And um, so the main report, as well as really importantly, a, a case study annex, which actually provides the detailed evidence uh, of that bottom up analysis. So in the rest of this presentation, we just thought we'd summarize the key outputs um, of the work and our main findings. So um, before I go on to the, the evidence around the value, I'll hand over to Will, who will touch on how we've looked at the use of IM in this study. Thanks, Chelsea. So a um, quick introduction for me. I'm Will Squires. I'm, I'm a director in our infrastructure business. Um, and I led the Atkins contribution to this work. Um, in terms of background, I have a mixed background in civil engineering and data science, uh, which makes me very interested in this. Um, and I lead a lot of our works around advisory um, in the technology space in the built environment, and more interestingly, application of information management and data science to the sector. Um, now, in defining a definition for information management um, sufficient to allow us to sort of get to some of those quantitative and qualitative numbers that Chelsea spoke about and really draw a line around it. This was probably one of the most, um, I don't want to say contentious, but uh, spirited elements of the study. I'm um, trying to find something that succinctly drew a line around that which was related to um, use of information management within projects, but also organizations, um, and didn't stray too far into um, application of artificial intelligence or silver shots off into the distance um, around technology was quite complex. Um, and you can see just this very simple graphic on the side. What we wanted to do was to create something that allowed us to articulate information management as something that supported digital transformation um, and supported a lot of other ongoing transformation initiatives in the sector. And Ron spoke to the value toolkit without um, encompassing all of its benefits. Now, if you look at previous reports on this sort of um, uh, sort of an analysis of a benefits perspective, often some of the detail can become muddied and cover all of the benefits, for example, associated with purchasing a drone and replacing um, a previously manual on-site service all the way through to visualization of that data in an environment. So the definition we've come up with is um, an information management improves the quality and availability and timeliness of information related to uh, delivery of the asset. Um, and it facilitates more efficient and efficient, ooh, efficient and effective decisions and investments across the life cycle. And it's a key enabler of digital transformation. Now, we focused here a lot on the process of information management, the specification, distribution, production, maintenance, storage, archiving, assurance, and data security. And this is meant to be complementary and build on the work of the UK BIM framework, um, which sets out an approach for implementing BIM in the UK using the framework. Um, if you flick over to the next slide, Chelsea, I'll speak a little bit to some of the detail and, and some of the examples as to why we felt this information was necessary. So this slide shows the overarching case studies we, we sort of deep dove into as part of this study. And I actually kind of want to use a bit of a, a pithy example here. People often talk about the four V's of data, um, volume, variety, velocity, veracity, and sometimes value, which this report is about. Now, now, the important thing about this case study um, list for us is, first of all, volume. Um, previous reports, if you look at the PwC report, had two case studies, and here we have 11. But interestingly, we also had maybe 30 or 40 different in our, um, in our shortlist. And actually, this shows the sheer scale of adoption of information management within the sector, and sort of evidences the fact that this is very much a more present and important topic within industry than it was even five years ago. Um, the second word here is uh, variety. And what you see here actually is a wonderfully varied set of examples of how organizations have adopted information management, um, from use of uh, information management to deliver kit of parts home, through to uh, the adoption of the Excel facility with BDP um, to sort of help solve the COVID crisis. Uh, there's a wonderful level of um, variety here that again shows the different ways organizations are adopting the principles of information management and delivering value from them. The, the third point here is velocity. And I think one thing we see here in the sector is, is there's two lenses. One is the rate of change is accelerated. Um, and also the rate of change in different organizations is accelerated. What we see again across this case study is some 
organizations really wholesalely adopting information management and blazing ahead, um, well as others are very much in the sort of storming phase. But this, uh, the level of adoption here is what's exciting. Um, and the final point here is veracity uh, when you're talking about data. And hopefully this body of information gives us a little bit more truth um, to help organizations um, justify investment in information management. And I won't speak to that for too much longer. Chelsea, if you want to flip to the last slide, then I'll hand back to you. Um, an, an important thing for us here again was to try move away from a lot of the project or asset or very specific level definitions of information management and move to some summary categories to capture benefits that spoke to um, things that a business leader or somebody holding a financial account might, um, might speak to more specifically. Now, if you look at the top bin here around asset project and program management, this covers the more classical examples of BIM implementation in the capital phase, in the operational phase, and in the estimation and planning phase. And just a note here that we ensured the, the um, accounting here accounts for both cost and carbon um, to keep that simple. The second big bucket of areas we began to see information management delivering benefit was in um, the financial and commercial functions within businesses um, and everything from sort of timesheets and financial reporting through to uh, better cash flow analysis on projects. Um, the third lens, and this is often spoken to in the digital twin space, was sort of looking at um, organizational planning and response. And we felt there were two main uh, buckets to this, one being the longer term strategic and portfolio planning, and the second being shorter term incident management. And finally, we looked at the sort of buckets of risk and audit and compliance as key business levels for driving change. Now, Chelsea, I'll hand back to you and you can perhaps take colleagues through how that maps out into benefits. Thanks, Will. Um, yeah, so uh, in summary, this is the information benefits framework that's presented and detailed in our report. And Will's just talked us through the front end of that framework, which is thinking about the different um, IM use cases within the sector. Uh, at that organization as well as project level um, and we refer to then the impacts that those use cases can have so what's the, the value um, that that drives directly for organizations which is our sort of second block within the framework and then looking beyond the organization to wider stakeholders or beneficiaries from that organization's use of information management um, and kind of the, the detail under each of these building blocks is detailed in our, our report. We'll, we'll touch on the key points shortly. I think it's important to note that um, the framework we're presenting is not intended to be a prescriptive methodology um, for measuring and quantifying the value of, of information management. Um, as we detail in our report, the individual impact pathways that get you from left to right are highly context specific. There's such a broad range of IM use cases and so many range of outcomes that those use cases can have. But the, the framework is here to serve as an overview, as Will said, to kind of key decision makers to, to provide that kind of integrated and consistent basis for thinking through what are the different building blocks of value. Um, and in short, we identify three key elements. So as we say here and, and across the report, really the case for investing in, in IM is threefold. And um, firstly, the productivity gains it directly unlocks for those organizations using IM. Secondly, the growth it can drive in the wider economy uh, and ultimately UK GDP. And then finally, thirdly, um, the social value it can um, deliver more broadly for cost customers, society and the environment. And so what I wanted to do was just to touch on each of those three categories of value and just pull out some of the headline findings from our main report and then open up for discussion. So firstly, direct value for organizations which use IM through enhanced productivity gains. And through the study, we've identified three key drivers or ways in which these productivity gains can come about. So firstly, um, and I'm at the top left of this slide, from the cost saved or avoided from the use of IM. So I am through things like increased efficiency, reducing risk, uh, enables organizations to deliver the same or better output uh, for less cost. And that in itself is a productivity gain. Secondly, an alternative form of gain is, is the ability to increase output or revenue for the same amount of input or effort. Um, so getting more from our assets 
um, the use of IM to then spur innovation and the development of new products and services um, driving growth of organisations. And then thirdly, what we've captured here is a sort of capsule of intangible benefits. So things like reputation and culture, the kind of um, collaboration um, and uh, ethos that's created by the use of IM, as well as factors like health and safety of the workforce that are improved through the use of IM. All of those factors can be difficult to measure, but actually once you think them through, they do link to increased productivity in the long run. If you think about reducing the cost of customer complaints, for example, from that improved reputation or leading to increased demand for an organization's services or attracting a highly skilled or retaining a highly skilled workforce within the business, all of those things ultimately contribute to productivity. And through the case studies, um, we spent a lot of time and effort working with stakeholders uh, to quantify these productivity gains wherever possible. And we were able to do that for around two thirds of those 11 case studies. And as just as we flagged up here, we found that evidence of total cost savings worth between £6.90 and £7.40 for every £1 invested in IM. Um, and we also found looking specifically at labour productivity, so labour time savings, uh, those returns could be worth between £5.10 and £6 for every £1 invested in IM. And where we weren't able to establish those kind of return on investment multipliers through information or sort of data limitations, we were still able to then quantify um, the percentage cost savings enabled through the use of IM uh, and at different stages of the design and construction phases of uh, built assets. And we, we found quite a broad range and that is reflective of the, the range of use cases. And as I said, highly context specific uh, cases in each of those, but those cost savings ranging from 1.6% to a through to 18%. Devils in the detail, when you look at our report about that, what those cost savings relate to, hence the wide range. So just a word of caution there. Um, it was more difficult to, um, to quantify the, um, the cost savings or productivity gains um, realized in operations. And I think really that's a reflection of, of two things. Firstly, um, there was a kind of more limited evidence, kind of monitoring and evaluation evidence post capital handover into operations that says things that were done in the design construction stage leading to savings in operations. There's just a lack of pure lack of information or sort of data collection of those gains. And, and then secondly, I think a reflection of the fact that the use cases for IM are more emerging in, in operations. So actually the, both the use and value of IM at operation stage is, is kind of a less established space. So certainly through the existing literature and case studies that um, we looked at. Um, and I think it's just important to finally flag, I won't go through all of them here, but that there were some, you know, the use of IM alone is not sufficient to secure these um, productivity gains. There are other important enablers that go aside alongside the use of IM. Uh, and a lot of that comes down to people and leadership. Uh, and ultimately, as I've already raised that point about data collection um, and a kind of a, a continuous improvement approach, we can only value what we can measure. So the more we get better at doing that, you know, we'll have a stronger evidence base and case for investing in sort of the next phase or the next um, range of uses for IM. So secondly, moving on to um, this, the area of value in terms of the wider economy. So it's important as we note throughout our report that the value of IM is not limited to the organizations that use it, nor the industry alone. The construction sector itself is a, you know, a very significant, important sector within the wider economy. And it has a very strong, what we refer to as kind of upstream and downstream economic linkages uh, with other sectors. So the construction sector buys inputs um, to produce its outputs in terms of raw materials, professional services, et cetera. And so if we get have a more productive construction sector um, and output of the sector increases, it will pull on those inputs and demand more inputs from those other sectors. So there are gains upstream. And then secondly, downstream, 
the, the, the construction sector is pretty unique in that it creates the capital that is then used by all other parts of the economy. So we have other firms and households across all other sectors that rely on the construction sector to produce and consume their own goods and services. And so if we make the construction sector more productive and that then increases output or brings down prices for those um, sectors downstream, that too has a kind of ripple effect through the wider economy. And so those two effects together, we captured through our top-down economic impact modeling. So we use what's referred to as a CG model, um, that's an in-house model of KPMG's, first time applying it to, to the construction sector for um, policies which uh, focus on improving productivity. And that analysis found that for every one pound of direct productivity gain that we generate within the sector, looking at productivity across the design, construction and maintenance of built assets, we could potentially generate a further £3.70 of additional annual UK GDP in the long run, so looking out to 2051. And that's through the ripple effects of that that I described there um, that translate into wider growth in the economy over time. And it's important that in that £3.70 of GDP, most of those gains are outside of the construction sector itself. Uh, so as we've highlighted here, that leads to increased household consumption, increased investment, net exports, and ultimately it means people are being paid a better wage um, elsewhere in the economy. Just a final couple of two implications that also were important coming out of our analysis is that um, we, we found, we looked at a range of scenarios. I flagged up the kind of £3.70 return here. We tested you know, a range of scenarios looking at what if we were to just improve productivity at different stages of the asset life cycle. Um, and we found that overall the GDP gains to the whole economy were greater when we included the maintenance of built assets alongside design and construction. And so really that just underlines the importance of those emerging use cases in operations that I mentioned earlier and taking that whole life cost approach uh, when thinking about the value that IM can drive. And then just finally that our analysis assumes um, that there is widespread uptake of IM and as a result, widespread productivity gains across the sector, including the long tail of SMEs, um, which we know in the literature, and I'm sure as everyone's aware here in practice, there are barriers to the adoption of IM for those smaller firms, which needs to be overcome if we're to realise the full extent of these wider economic returns. And then just finally, um, our third um, key area of value is that wider social value for customers, society and the environment. And that wider value comes about by the role that IM plays in enabling higher quality and more sustainable built assets. Um, and this is something which is, uh, this is value which is typically difficult to quantify or measure. And in many cases, it doesn't have a kind of market price like that's traded in the economy, like GDP, we can, we can, we can put a pound figure that's traded, but th this still has important public value. There are approaches, indeed government, in the way that it appraises infrastructure investments looks very comprehensively at this um, social value and provides approaches to put pound values uh, on such impacts. The challenge is that within the IM space, um, this is perhaps kind of uh, not so well established or understood in terms of firstly understanding that link between how IM drives social value, but then secondly, how do you go about actually quantifying and putting a, you know, a, a pound value in, in, on that public value or social value that, that's created? Um, so again, lots of details in our report, but two, two different categories of social value impacts um, of when thinking about this in terms of the role of IM. Firstly, the role of IM can lead to um, better quality services, as we said, higher quality, more sustainable assets that provides a benefit to the end users of those assets. So uh, less disruption or less downtime of an asset or more reliable assets to customers ultimately provides them with the benefit. Similarly, if we're able to bring down the costs of the services they receive, that too provides a benefit um, to end users. 
But beyond the direct users of the infrastructure, there are what we refer to as externalities in the construction and operation of built assets. So when you start to think about the role that IM can play in um, improving sustainability, for example, bringing down the carbon footprint of our built assets, you know, that clearly those carbon impacts um, have a, a wider cost to society and it's possible to put a value on that. And in a couple of select cases of our case studies, we were able to, um, to work with stakeholders to quantify the potential value, social value that IM unlocks. Um, it's important to note that this is a particularly different area to a difficult area, sorry, to isolate the specific role of IM versus other factors. But the analysis does demonstrate that relatively modest investments in IM can generate substantial um, benefits in terms of social value. Um, and just finally, though, I think a key implication or a couple of key implications from, from the work is that firstly, as I've said, this is an area that is um, perhaps not so well understood by organisations. Um, typically, we found um, organisations weren't necessarily thinking from the outset about this social value and building that into uh, the kind of investment case for IM. And if, if it was being done, it was more focused on the metrics that could have a more direct financial implication for the organisation rather than thinking about social value in its broadest sense. Um, even if it ultimately has no direct bearing on the organization's operations. And then secondly, as I've already alluded to, that whilst there are methods that exist for putting pound values on these types of impacts, they're relatively complex, require a specialist set of skills, and that doesn't necessarily sit within the toolkit of um, IM teams, um, IM practitioners. So if we are to get um, people thinking about this, we need to think about um, the skills uh, that are needed at that kind of investment case stage to, to, to truly um, capture the, the full range of impacts in terms of social value and an attempt to quantify and value them as far as possible. So right. that's a very quick canter through, uh, lots to take in, I appreciate. Um, that brings us to the end of the presentation. <laughs>